This lecture, The Nature and Value of Economics, was delivered at the Jefferson School Fall Seminars in September and October of 1990. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our seminar. I know that at this hour in the morning, bright and as fresh as you are, uh, there is nothing you are more eager for than electron economics. <laughs> and so I'll just jump right in. Economics has been defined in a variety of ways. In the 19th century, it was typically defined as the science of wealth or of exchangeable wealth. In the 20th century, it has typically been defined as the science which studies the allocation of scarce means among competing ends. I define economics as the science which studies the production of wealth under a system of division of labor. That is, under a system in which the individual lives by producing or helping to produce just one, or at most a relatively few things, and is supplied by the labor of others for the far greater part of his wants. The essential theme of economics, present implicitly or explicitly, in the writings of all the truly great economists, from Adam Smith to Ludwig von Mises, is that the laws and social institutions necessary to the successful functioning, indeed to the very existence of the division of labor, are those of capitalism. Capitalism is a social system based on private ownership of the means of production. It is characterized by the pursuit of material self-interest under freedom, and it rests on, the, on a foundation of the cultural influence of reason. Based on its foundations and essential nature, capitalism is further characterized by saving and capital accumulation, exchange and money, financial self-interest and the profit motive, the freedoms of economic competition and economic inequality, the price system, economic progress, and a harmony of the self-interests of all the individuals who participate in it. Economics shows that every essential feature of capitalism either underlies or is profoundly influenced by the division of labor. When the connections between capitalism and the division of labor have been understood, it becomes clear that economics, as the science which studies the production of wealth under a system of division of labor, is actually the science which studies the production of wealth under capitalism. Economic study of the consequences of government intervention and of socialism turn out to be merely studies of the impairment or outright destruction of capitalism and the division of labor. The importance of economics derives from the specific importance of wealth, material goods, to human life and well-being. While the role of wealth in human life is a subject that needs considerable elaboration, its importance can be accepted on a common sense basis. Obviously, human life depends on food, clothing, and shelter. Moreover, experience shows that there is no limit to the amount of wealth that practically all civilized men and women desire, and that the greatest part of their waking hours is actually spent in efforts to acquire it, namely in efforts to earn an income. Yet the importance of wealth by itself is not sufficient to establish the importance of economics. Robinson Crusoe on a desert island would need wealth, and his ability to produce it would be helped if he somehow managed to salvage from his ship books on various techniques of production. But it would not be helped by books on economics. All that books on economics could do for Crusoe would be to describe abstractly the essential nature of the activities he carries on without any knowledge of economics. And beyond that, merely to provide the possible intellectual stimulation he might feel as the result of increasing his knowledge of the society from which he was cut off. 
Something more than the importance of wealth is required to establish the importance of economics. <clears throat> that something is the fact that the production of wealth vitally depends on the division of labor. The division of labor is an essential characteristic of every advanced economic system. It underlies practically all of the gains we ascribe to technological progress and the use of improved tools and machinery. Its existence is indispensable for a high and rising productivity of labor, that is, output per unit of labor. By the same token, its absence is a leading characteristic of every backward economic system. It is the division of labor which introduces a degree of complexity into economic life that makes necessary the existence of a special science of economics. This is because the division of labor entails economic phenomena existing on a scale in space and time that makes it impossible to comprehend them by means of personal observation and experience alone. Economic life under a division of labor can be comprehended only by means of an organized body of knowledge that proceeds by means of deductive reasoning from elementary principles. This, of course, is the work of the science of economics. The division of labor is thus the central fact that necessitates the existence of the subject of economics. Despite its vital importance, the division of labor as a country's dominant form of productive organization, that is, a division of labor society, is a relatively recent phenomenon in history. It goes back no further than 18th century Britain. Even today, it is limited to little more than the United States, the former British dominions, the countries of Western Europe, and Japan. The dominant form of productive organization in most of the world, in the vast interiors of Asia, Africa, and most of Latin America, and everywhere for most of history, has been the largely self-sufficient production of farm families, and before that, of tribes of nomads and hunters. <clears throat> what makes the science of economics necessary and important is the fact that while human life and well-being depend on the production of wealth, and the production of wealth depends on the division of labor, the division of labor does not exist or function automatically. Its functioning crucially depends on the laws and institutions countries adopt. A country can adopt laws and institutions that make it possible for the division of labor to grow and flourish, as the United States did in the late 18th century. Or it can adopt laws and institutions that prevent the division of labor from growing and flourishing, as is the case in most of the world today, and was the case everywhere for most of history. Indeed, a country can adopt laws and institutions that cause the division of labor to decline and practically cease to exist. The leading historical example of this occurred under the Roman Empire in the third and fourth centuries of the Christian era. The result was that the relatively advanced economic system of the ancient world was replaced by feudalism, an economic system characterized by the self-sufficiency of small territories. In the present day world, socialism is a formula for the destruction of the division of labor and reversion to feudalism. In order for a country to act intelligently in adopting laws and institutions that bear upon economic life, it is clearly necessary that its citizens understand the principles that govern the development and functioning of the division of labor. That is, understand the principles of economics. If they do not, then it is only a question of time before that country will adopt more and more destructive laws and institutions, ultimately stopping all further economic progress and causing actual economic decline with all that that implies about the conditions of human life. In the absence of a widespread serious understanding of the principles of economics, the citizens of an advanced division of labor society such as our own are in a position analogous to that of a crowd 
wandering among banks of computers or other highly complex machinery with no understanding of the functioning or maintenance or safety requirements of the equipment and randomly pushing buttons and pulling levers. This is no exaggeration. In the absence of knowledge of economics, our contemporaries feel perfectly free to enact measures such as currency depreciation and price controls. They feel free casually to experiment with the destruction of such fundamental economic institutions as the freedom of contract, inheritance, and private ownership of the means of production itself. In the absence of a knowledge of economics, our civilization is perfectly capable of destroying itself, and in the view of some observers, is actually in the process of doing so. Thus, the importance of economics consists in the fact that ultimately our entire modern material civilization depends on its being understood. What rests on modern material civilization is not only the well-being, but also the very lives of the great majority of people now living. In the absence of an extensive division of labor that we now possess, the production of modern medicines and vaccines, the provision of modern sanitation and hygiene, and the production even of adequate food supplies for our present numbers would simply be impossible. The territory of the continental United States, for example, <clears throat> counting the deserts and mountains and rivers and lakes, amounts to less than nine acres per person of its present population not enough to enable that population to survive as primitive farmers. In Western Europe and Japan, the problem of overpopulation would, of course, be far more severe. Needless to say, the present vast populations of Asia, Africa, and Latin America would be unable to survive in the absence of Western food and medical supplies. Apart from the very survival of a division of labor society and all that depends on it, the most important application of economics is to provide the knowledge necessary for the adoption of government policies conducive to the smooth and efficient functioning of such a society. On the basis of the knowledge it provides, economics offers logically demonstrable solutions for all the leading politico-economic problems of our time. For example, it explains very clearly how to stop such major present-day problems as inflation, shortages, depressions, and mass unemployment, and how to turn capital decumulation into capital accumulation, and a declining productivity of labor into a rising productivity of labor. In addition, economics can very clearly show how to achieve economic progress all across the world, and is potentially capable of playing an enormous role in eliminating the intellectual and economic causes both of domestic strife and of international conflict and war. The essential solution to all of these problems economics shows is the enlargement of economic freedom. Because it explains what promotes and what impairs the functioning of the division of labor, economics is an essential tool for understanding the world's history, the broad sweep of its periods of progress and its periods of decline, and the journalistic events of any given time. Its applications include a grasp of the causes of the decline of ancient civilization and the rise of the modern industrial world, both of which events can be understood in terms of the rise or fall in the division of labor. <clears throat> Economics brings to the understanding of history and journalism a foundation of scientific knowledge which can serve historians and journalists in much the same way as a knowledge of mathematics and natural science. Namely, it can give to historians and journalists a knowledge of what is and is not possible, and therefore a knowledge of what can and cannot qualify as an explanation of economic phenomena. For example, a knowledge of modern natural science precludes any historical or journalistic explanation of events based on Ptolemaic astronomy or the phlogiston theory of chemistry. 
not to mention based on beliefs in such notions as witchcraft, astrology, or any form of supernaturalism. In exactly the same way, a knowledge of economics precludes any historical or journalistic explanation of events based on such doctrines as the Marxian theory of exploitation and class warfare, or on the belief that machinery causes unemployment, or that depressions are caused by overproduction. Economics can also serve historians and journalists as a guide to what further facts to look for in the explanation of economic events. For example, whenever shortages exist, it tells them to look for government controls limiting the rise in prices. Whenever unemployment exists, it tells them to look for government interference limiting the fall in money wage rates. And whenever a depression exists, it tells them to look for a preceding expansion of money and credit. Economics also has powerful implications for ethics. <clears throat> it demonstrates exhaustively that in a division of labor capitalist society, one man's gain is not another man's loss. That indeed, it is actually other men's gain, especially in the case of the building of great fortunes. In essence, economics demonstrates that the rational self-interests of all men are harmonious. In so doing, economics raises a leading voice against the traditional ethics of altruism and self-sacrifice. It presents society, a division of labor capitalist society, not as an entity over and above the individual to whom he must sacrifice his interests, but as an indispensable means within which the individual can fulfill the ultimate ends of his own personal life and happiness. A knowledge of economics is indispensable for anyone who seeks to understand his own place in the modern world and that of others. It is a powerful antidote to unfounded feelings of being the victim or perpetrator of exploitation, in quotes, and to all feelings of, quote, alienation, unquote, based on the belief that the economic world is uh, immoral, purposeless, or chaotic. Such unfounded feelings rest on an ignorance of economics. The feelings pertaining to alleged exploitation rest on ignorance of the productive role of various economic functions, such as those of businessmen and capitalists, retailing and wholesaling, and advertising and speculation, and on the resulting conviction that essentially only manual labor is productive and is therefore the only legitimate form of, productive, of economic activity. Feelings pertaining to the alleged purposelessness of much of economic activity rest on ignorance of the role of wealth in human life beyond the immediate necessities of food, clothing, and shelter, which ignorance leads to the conclusion that economic activity beyond the provision of these necessities serves no legitimate purpose. Feelings pertaining to the alleged chaos of economic activity rest on ignorance of the knowledge economics provides of the benevolent role of capitalist institutions, such as private ownership of the means of production, the profit motive, and the price system. Economics, economic science works to counteract such feelings of alienation by making the economic world fully intelligible. It explains the foundations of the enormous economic progress which has taken place in the Western world over the last two centuries. And in providing demonstrable solutions for all the world's major economic problems, it points the way for intelligent action to make possible radical and progressive improvement in the material conditions of human beings everywhere. As a result, knowledge of the subject cannot help but support the conviction that the fundamental nature of the world is benevolent and thus that there is no rational basis for feelings of fundamental estrangement from the world. Now, despite popular convictions, uh, economics is not a science of quantitative predictions. It does not provide reliable information on such matters as what the price of a common stock or commodity will be in the future, or what the gross national product will be in the next year or quarter. 
However, a knowledge of economics does provide an important intellectual framework for making business and personal financial decisions. For example, a businessman who understands economics is in a far better position to appreciate what the demand for his firm's products depends on than a businessman who does not. Similarly, an individual investor who understands economics is in a vastly better position to protect himself from the consequences of such things as inflation or deflation than one who does not. But the most important application of economics to business and investment is that only a widespread knowledge of economics can assure the continued exist existence or the very activities of business and investment. These activities are prohibited under socialism. In a socialist society, such as that of Soviet Russia, which is governed by the belief that profits and interest are incomes derived from exploitation, individuals who attempt to engage in business or investment activity have been sent to concentration camps or executed. Business activities can endure and flourish only in a society which understands economics and which is therefore capable of appreciating their value. The value of economics to the businessman should be thought of not as teaching businessmen how to make money, which is a talent that businessmen possess to an incalculably greater degree than economists. <clears throat> but as explaining why it is to the self-interest of everyone that businessmen should be free to make money. This is something which businessmen do not know, which it is vital to them and to everyone else uh, that they should know, and which economics is uniquely qualified to explain. Knowledge of economics is indispensable to the defense of individual rights. The philosophy of individual rights as set forth in the writings of John Locke and the Declaration of Independence and Constitution of the United States has been thoroughly undermined as the result of the influence of wrong economic theories, above all the theories of Karl Marx and the socialists. The essential conclusion of such theories is that in the economic sphere, the exercise of individual rights, as understood by Locke and the founding fathers of the United States, serves merely to enable the capitalists to exploit the workers and consumers, or is otherwise comparably destructive to the interests of the great majority of people. Precisely as a result of the influence of these vicious ideas, culminating in the victory of the New Deal, the Supreme Court of the United States has, since 1937, simply abandoned the defense of economic freedom. Since that time, it has allowed Congress and the state legislatures and even unelected regulatory agencies to do practically anything they wish in this area. The Constitution and Bill of Rights and all prior American legal precedent to the contrary notwithstanding. A thorough knowledge of economics is essential to understanding why the exercise of individual rights in the economic sphere is not only not harmful to the interests of others, but is in the foremost interest of everyone. It is essential if the American people are ever to reclaim the safeguards to economic freedom provided by their constitution or if people anywhere are to be able to establish and maintain systems of government based on meaningful respect for individual rights. Indeed, in demonstrating the harmony of the rational self-interests of all men under freedom, economics has no more important value than that of helping to uphold the philosophy of individual rights. The nature and importance of economics imply that study of the subject should form an important part of the general education of every intelligent person. The economics I'm talking about, it must not be forgotten, is the genuine economics of the British classical and Austrian economists, not the pseudo-economics of the Marxists and Keynesians. That is the economics of, of economists such as Adam Smith and Ludwig von Mises, not the material of such writers as John Kenneth Galbraith and Paul Samuelson. 
Economics, properly so-called, belongs alongside mathematics, natural science, history, philosophy, and the humanities as an integral part of a liberal education in the modern world. It deserves an especially prominent place in the education of lawyers, businessmen, journalists, historians, the writers of literary works, and university, college, and secondary school teachers of the humanities and social sciences. These are the groups that play the dominant role in forming people's attitudes concerning legislation and social institutions, and whose work can most profit from an understanding of economics. Economic activity and the development of economic institutions, of course, do not take place in a vacuum. They are profoundly influenced by the fundamental philosophical convictions people hold. The development of capitalist institutions and the elevation of the level of production to the standard it has reached over the last two centuries presuppose the acceptance of a this-worldly, pro-reason philosophy. Indeed, in their essential development, the institutions of capitalism and the economic progress that result represent the implementation of man's right to life, as that right has been described by Ayn Rand, <clears throat> namely as the right to take all the actions required by the nature of a rational being for the support, the furtherance, the fulfillment, and the enjoyment of his own life." Unquote. Simply put, capitalism is the economic system that develops insofar as people are free to exercise their right to life and choose to do so. The implementation of the right to life <clears throat> is constituted by the pursuit of rational self-interest under freedom. If individuals both possess freedom and at the same time rationally desire to improve their lives and well-being, then they have only to use their minds to look at reality consider the various opportunities that nature and the existence of other people offer them for serving their self-interest, and choose to pursue whichever of the opportunities confronting them they judge best. They can do whatever they judge it is most to their self-interest to do, provided only that they do not initiate the use of force against others. What people do in these circumstances is spontaneously set about establishing or extending and reinforcing all the other institutions, in addition to freedom and limited government, that constitute a capitalist economic system, namely such institutions as private ownership of the means of production, saving and capital accumulation, exchange and money, the profit motive, and the price system. <clears throat> Thus, in pursuing their rational self-interest under freedom, they appropriate previously unowned land from nature and make it into private property. Being secure in their possession of property from violent appropriation by others, and rational enough to act on the basis of long-run considerations, they save and accumulate capital, which increases their ability to produce and consume in the future. For example, following the appropriation of land they clear trees, remove rocks, drain, irrigate, build, and do whatever else is necessary to establish and improve farms, and later on, uh, commercial and industrial enterprises. They also perceive the advantages of performing exchanges with others and of establishing division of labor. They perceive the advantages of indirect exchange, that is, of accepting goods not because they want them themselves, but because others want them, and the goods can thus be used as means of further exchanges. Out of indirect exchange, money develops, with the result that the division of labor is enabled radically to intensify, to the point where each individual finds it to his interest to produce or help to produce just one or at most a very few things, for which he is paid money, which he in turn uses to buy from others virtually all that he himself consumes. In the context of a division of labor monetary economy, the individual's pursuit of his material self-interest gives rise to the narrower principle of financial self-interest, that is, of preferring other things equal to buy at lower prices rather than higher prices and to sell at higher prices rather than lower prices. In a monetary economy, 
These are the ways to increase the goods one can obtain. In combination, they represent the profit motive, the principle of buying cheap and selling dear. The individual's pursuit of self-interest also gives rise to economic inequality, as those who are more intelligent and ambitious outstrip those who are less intelligent and ambitious, and to economic competition, as different sellers seek to sell to the same customers and as different buyers seek to buy one and the same supply of a good or service. The combination of the profit motive and the freedom of competition in turn constitutes the basis of the price system and all its laws of price determination. Thus, rational self-interest and the individual's freedom to act on the basis of it underlie private property, saving and capital accumulation, the division of labor, exchange and money, financial self-interest and the profit motive, economic inequality, economic competition, and the price system. In a word, the whole range of capitalism's economic institutions. The combined effect of these institutions is economic progress. That is, the increase in the productive power of human labor and the consequent enjoyment of rising standards of living. Economic progress is the natural accompaniment of rationality and the freedom to act on it. This is so because the continued exercise of rationality creates a growing sum of scientific and technological knowledge from generation to generation. This, together with the profit motive, the freedom of competition, the incentive to save and accumulate capital, and the existence of a division of labor society, is the essential basis of continuous economic progress. Economic progress is the leading manifestation of yet another leading institution of capitalism, the harmony of the rational self-interests of all men, in which the success of each promotes the interests of all. The basis of capitalism's harmony of interests is the combination of freedom and rational self-interest operating in the context of their institutional creation, the division of labor. Under freedom, no one may use force to obtain the cooperation of others. He must obtain their cooperation voluntarily. To do this, he must show them how cooperation with him is to their self-interest as well as his own, and indeed is more to their self-interest than pursuing any of the alternatives that are open to them. To find customers or workers and suppliers, he must show how dealing with, th with him benefits them as well as himself and benefits them more than buying from others or selling to others. Economics shows that the gains from the division of labor make the existence of situations of mutual benefit omnipresent under capitalism. The division of labor in combination with the rest of capitalism represents a regular institutionalized arrangement whereby the mind of each in serving its individual possessor serves the well-being of a multitude of others and is motivated and enabled to serve it better and better. Thus, the institutions of capitalism represent, in effect, a self-expanded power of human reason to serve human life. The growing abundance of goods that results is the material means by which people further fulfill and enjoy their lives and do so in conditions in which all can gain and none need lose. The deeper philosophical requirements of capitalism are identical with the philosophical requirements of the recognition and implementation of man's right to life namely the acceptance of a philosophy of reason. Philosophical convictions pertaining to the reality and primacy of the material world of sensory experience determine the extent to which people are concerned with this world and with improving their lives in it. When, for example, people seriously held the idea that the material world is superseded by another higher world for which their life in this world is merely a test and a preparation, and in which they will spend eternity, they had little motive to devote much thought and energy to material improvement. 
It was only when the philosophical conviction grew that the senses are valid and sensory perception is the only legitimate basis of knowledge that they could turn their full thought and attention to this world. This change was an indispensable precondition to the development of the pursuit of material self-interest as a leading force in people's lives and thus of their actually implementing their right to life as far as they had the power to do so. The cultural acceptance of the closely related philosophical conviction that the world operates according to definite and knowable principles of cause and effect was equally indispensable to the implementation of the right to life and thus to economic development. This conviction is the essential foundation of science and technology. It tells scientists and inventors that answers exist and can be found if only they will keep on looking for them. Without this conviction, science and technology could not and would not be pursued. There could be no quest for answers if people were not first convinced that answers can be found. In addition to the emphasis on this worldly concerns and the grasp of the principle of cause and effect, the influence of reason shows up in the development of the individual's conceptual ability to give a sense of present reality to his life in decades to come and in his identification of himself as a self-responsible causal agent with the power to improve his life. This combination of ideas is what produced in people such attitudes as the realization that hard work pays and that they must accept responsibility for their future by means of saving. The same combination of ideas helped to provide the intellectual foundation for the establishment and extension of property rights as incentives to production and saving. Private property rights rest on the recognition of the principle of causality in the form that those who are to implement the causes must be motivated by being able to benefit from the effects they create. They also rest on a foundation of secularism, of the recognition of the rightness of being concerned with material improvement. Thus, insofar as production and the implementation of the right to life depends on people's desire to improve their material conditions and on science, technology, hard work, saving, and private property, it fundamentally depends on the influence of a this-worldly pro-reason philosophy. And to the extent that production depends on peace and tranquility, on limited government, and on economic and political freedom, in a word on respect for individual rights, it again fundamentally depends on the influence of a philosophy of reason. From the dawn of the Renaissance to the end of the 19th century, the growing conviction that reason is a reliable tool of knowledge and means of solving problems led to a decline in the level of violence and the frequency of warfare in Western society as people and governments became increasingly willing to settle disputes by means of discussion and persuasion based on logic and facts. This was a necessary precondition of the development of the incentive and the means for the stepped-up capital accumulation required by a modern economic system. This is so because if people are confronted with a chronic threat of losing what they save and again and again do lose it, whether to local robbers or marauding invaders, they cannot have either the incentive or the means to accumulate capital. During the same period of time, as part of the same process, a growing confidence in the reliability and power of human reason led to the elevation of people's view of man as the being distinguished by the possession of reason. Because he was held to possess incomparably the highest and best form of knowledge, man came to be regarded on philosophical grounds as incomparably the highest and best creature in the natural order capable of action on a grand and magnificent scale and with unlimited potential for improvement. In conjunction with the further philosophical conviction that what actually exists are always individual concretes, not abstractions as such, and thus not collectives or groups of any kind, the elevated view of man meant an elevated view of the individual human being and his individual potential. In their logically consistent form, these ideas led to a view of the individual as both supremely valuable, as an end in himself, 
and as fully competent to run his own life. The application, in turn, of this view of the individual to society and politics is what provided the foundation for the acceptance of the doctrine of, the inalienable, indivi of inalienable individual rights and of government as existing for no other purpose than to secure those rights in order to leave the individual free to pursue his own happiness. It is important to point out, in addition, that the same view of man and the human individual, when accepted as a personal standard to be lived up to, was the inspiration for individuals to undertake large-scale accomplishments and to persevere against hardship and failure in order to succeed. It inspired them when they set out to explore the world, discover laws of nature, establish a proper form of government, invent new products and methods of production, and build new businesses and brand new industries. It was the inspiration for the pioneering spirit and sense of self-reliance and self-responsibility that once pervaded American society at all levels of ability, and a leading manifestation of which is the spirit of great entrepreneurship. Well, thus, as you can see, the philosophical requirements of capitalism are clearly those which underlie the recognition and implementation of man's right to life, namely a philosophy of reason. Incidentally, I want to say that the best discussion of the influence of philosophy on capitalism and economic development that I know of is a lecture delivered by Dr. Leonard Peikoff under the title, The Philosophic Basis of Capitalism. It was the inspiration for much of what I've said on this subject. Now, uh, in the very fact of propounding sound economic theories concerning, uh, of propounding sound theories concerning the economic world, and thus in presenting the case for capitalism, economics cannot avoid being highly controversial. It is necessary to explain the reasons. In addition to the general philosophical assault on reason, and thus on all of the ultimate foundations of capitalism, virtually every specific aspect of capitalism and of the economic development it represents <clears throat> is savagely denounced by large segments of public opinion. The pursuit of self-interest is condemned as evil, <clears throat> and of material self-interest as vulgar besides. Freedom under capitalism is ridiculed as the freedom to starve and as wage slavery. Private property is condemned as theft from a patrimony allegedly given by God or nature to the human race as a whole. Money is denounced as the root of all evil and the division of labor as the cause of one-sided development, narrowness, and alienation. The profit motive is attacked as the cause of starvation wages exhausting hours, sweatshops, and child labor, and of monopolies, inflation, depressions, wars, imperialism, and racism. It is also blamed for poisoned foods, dangerous drugs and automobiles, unsafe buildings and workplaces, planned obsolescence, pornography, prostitution, alcoholism, narcotics abuse, and crime. <clears throat> Saving is condemned as hoarding, competition as the law of the jungle, and economic inequality as the basis of class warfare. The price system and the harmony of interests are almost completely unheard of, while economic progress is held to be a, quote, ravaging of the planet, unquote, <clears throat> and in the form of improvements in efficiency, a cause of, of unemployment and depressions. At the same time, by the same logic, wars and destruction are regarded as necessary to prevent unemployment under capitalism. Practically all economic activity beyond that of manual labor employed in the direct production of goods <clears throat> is widely perceived as parasitical. Thus, businessmen and capitalists are denounced as recipients of unearned income and as exploiters. The stock and commodity markets are denounced as gambling casinos, retailers and wholesalers as middlemen, having no function but that of adding markups to the prices charged by farmers and manufacturers. <clears throat> and advertisers as inherently guilty of fraud, the fraud of attempting to induce people to desire the goods capitalism showers on them, but which they allegedly have no natural or legitimate basis for desiring. Despite the obvious contradictions, 
Capitalism is simultaneously denounced for impoverishing the masses and for providing them with affluence, <clears throat> for being a rigid class society and for being dominated by the upstart nouveau riche, for its competition and its alleged lack of competition, for its alleged militarism and its alleged pacifism, for its atheism and its alleged support of religion, for its alleged oppression of women and for its alleged destruction of the family by making women financially independent. Overall, capitalism is denounced as an anarchy of production, a chaos ruled by exploiters, robber barons, and profiteers who coldly, calculatingly, heartlessly, and greedily consume the efforts and destroy the lives of the broad masses of average innocent people. On the basis of all these mistaken beliefs, people turn to the government for social justice, for protection and aid in the form of labor and social legislation, for reason and order in the form of government planning. They demand, and for the most part have long ago obtained, progressive income and inheritance taxation, minimum wage and maximum hours laws, laws giving special privileges to, and immunities to labor unions, uh, antitrust legislation, social security legislation, public education, public housing, socialized medicine, nationalized or municipalized post offices, utilities, railroads, subways, and bus lines, <clears throat> subsidies for farmers, shippers, manufacturers, borrowers, lenders, the unemployed, students, tenants, and the needy and allegedly needy of every description. They have demanded and obtained food and drug regulations, building codes and zoning laws, occupational health and safety legislation, and more. They have demanded and obtained the creation of additional money and the abolition of every vestige of the gold standard to make possible the inflation of the money supply without limit. They have demanded this last in the belief that the additional spending, the additional money makes possible is the means of maintaining or achieving full employment and in the belief that creating money is a means of creating capital for lending and thus of reducing interest rates. The ability to create money has also been demanded because it is vital in enabling additional government expenditures to be financed by means of budget deficits and thus in fostering the delusion that the government can provide benefits for which the citizens do not pay. And when, as is inevitable, the policy of inflation results in rising prices, capital decumulation, and the destruction of credit, people demand price and wage controls. And then in response to the shortages and chaos that result, the government's total control over the economic system in the form of rationing and allocations. In the face of such ideas and demands, which have swept over the country with the force of a great flood, traditional American values of individual rights and limited government have appeared trivial and antiquated, appropriate perhaps to an age of independent farmers, but by no means to be permitted to stand in the way of what a frightened and angry mass of people perceive as the requirements virtually of their self-preservation. <clears throat> Indeed, so complete has been the destruction of traditional American values that the concept of individual rights has itself been made over into a vehicle serving demands for government subsidies and extensions of government power. In such forms as the assertion of rights to jobs, housing, education, pensions, medical care, and so on, as Ayn Rand has shown. Economics properly understood flies in the face of all such anti-capitalist ideas and demands. It implies that never have so many people been so ignorant and confused about a subject so important as the majority of people are about economics and capitalism. Indeed, economics shows that in its logically consistent form of laissez-faire capitalism, with the powers of government limited to those of national defense and the administration of justice, capitalism is a system of economic progress and prosperity for all and is a condition of world peace. There are a number of mutually reinforcing reasons for the prevailing mass of errors about economics and capitalism. Everyone is a participant in economic activity and as such develops or accepts opinions about economic life that seem consistent with his own observations of it. 
Yet these opinions are often mistaken because they rest on too narrow, or too narrow a range of experience, which renders them inconsistent with other aspects of experience of the same subject. Examples of this phenomenon in the everyday world of physical reality are such naive beliefs as that sticks bend in water, that the earth is flat, and that the sun revolves around the earth. In contrast with such naivete, a scientific process of thought seeks to develop the theory of a subject based on logical consistency with all the valid observations pertaining to it. Thus, the visual appearance of sticks being bent in water is reconciled with the fact that they continue to feel straight when subjected to touch, the reconciliation being knowledge of the refraction of light caused by water. The Earth's appearance of flatness is reconciled with such observations as the masts of ships first becoming visible on the horizon by knowledge of the very gradual curvature of the Earth. The appearance of the sun's revolution about the Earth is reconciled with the knowledge of the sun's relationship to other observable heavenly bodies through knowledge of the Earth's rotation about its own axis. <clears throat> Economics suffers from an apparent conflict between personal observation and scientific truth, probably to a greater extent than most other sciences. This is because of the very nature of the system of division of labor and monetary exchange. Every participant in the economic system is a specialist, aware of the effect of things on his own particular specialization. He does not stop to consider their effect on other specializations as well, nor does he consider what their longer run effect on him might be were he to change his specialization. As a result of this, people have come to believe such things as that improvements in production which can in fact necessitate the shrinkage or total disappearance of employment in any particular branch of the division of labor are economically harmful. <clears throat> By the same token, they have come to believe that acts of destruction, which can in fact result in an expansion of employment in particular branches of the division of labor, are economically beneficial. Closely related to the failure to look beyond one's own current specialization, <clears throat> is the widespread confusion between money and wealth. In a division of labor economy, everyone is naturally interested in earning money and comes to measure his economic well-being in terms of the money he earns. Thus, it is extremely easy for people to conclude that anything that enables the average person to earn more money is desirable, while anything that results in the average person's earning less money is undesirable. <clears throat> It takes a scientific analysis to show that while each individual is always economically best off earning as much money as the freedom of competition allows him to earn, people are not economically better off when average earnings increase as the result of government policies of creating money or when the government violates the freedom of competition. Indeed, economics shows that lower monetary earnings without money creation and without violations of the freedom of competition represent a higher actual standard of living than higher monetary earnings with them. <clears throat> Along these lines, there are even important cases in which even in the absence of money creation, it turns out that a lower national income or gross national product signifies a more rapid rate of increase in the production of wealth and improvement in human well-being than a higher national income or gross national product. This was a point I explained at the last TJS conference. <clears throat> if economics merely contradicted people's unscientific conclusions based on their personal observations, its path would be difficult enough. Its problems are enormously compounded, however, <clears throat> by the fact that its teachings also contradict some of the most deeply cherished moral and ethical doctrines. Above all, the doctrine that the pursuit of self-interest by the individual is harmful to the interests of others, and thus that it is the individual's obligation to practice altruism and self-sacrifice. Economics as a science studies the rational pursuit of material self-interest to which it traces the existence of all vital economic institutions and thus of material civilization itself, and from which it derives an entire body of economic laws. It cannot help concluding 
that rational self-interest and the profit motive are profoundly benevolent forces serving human life and well-being in every respect, and that they should be given perfect freedom in which to operate. Nevertheless, traditional morality regards self-interest as amoral at best, and indeed as positively immoral. It considers love of others and self-sacrifice for the sake of others to be man's highest virtues, around which he should build his life. Thus, the teachings of economics are widely perceived as a threat to morality. And by the same tokens, the same token, the anti-capitalistic slogans I described earlier are perceived as expressions of justified moral outrage. As a result, economics must make its way not merely against ignorance, but against ignorance supported by moral fervor and self-righteousness. Without the issue being named, economists are in a similar position to the old astronomers whose knowledge that the Earth revolved about the sun not only appeared to contradict what everyone could see for himself, but also stood as a challenge to the entire theological view of the universe. Economics and capitalism are a comparable challenge to the morality of altruism. It is almost certain that economics and capitalism will be unable to gain sufficient cultural acceptance to assure the influence of the one and the survival of the other until there is a radical change in people's ideas concerning morality and ethics, and that this change will be effected in fields other than economics, notably philosophy and psychology. But even so, economics itself has an enormous contribution to make in changing people's ideas on these subjects, a contribution which every advocate of rational self-interest would be well advised to utilize. A major reason for the condemnation of self-interest is certainly beliefs about its economic consequences. If people did not believe, for example, that one man's gain is another's loss, but on the contrary, that in a capitalist society one man's gain is actually other men's gain, their fear and hatred of self-interest could probably not be maintained. Yet precisely this is what economics proves. It proves what is actually the simplest thing in the world, namely that if individuals rationally seek to do good for themselves, each of them can in fact achieve his good. It proves that in a division of labor capitalist society, in the very nature of the process, in seeking his own good, the individual promotes the good of others, whose self-interested actions likewise promote the achievement of his good. Economics proves the existence of a harmony of the rational self-interests of all participants in the economic system. A harmony which permeates the institutions of private ownership of the means of production, economic inequality, and economic competition. At the same time, it shows that the fear of self-interest and the consequent prohibition of its pursuit is the one great cause of paralysis and stagnation. That if individuals are prohibited from doing good for themselves, their good simply cannot be achieved. The teachings of economics in counter-opposition not only from the supporters of altruism, but also from the practitioners of an irrational, short-sighted, self-defeating form of self-interest as well. These are, above all, the businessmen and wage earners whose short-run self-interests would be harmed by the free competition of capitalism and are protected or positively promoted by policies of government intervention and who do not scruple to seek government intervention. For example, the businessmen and wage earners who seek government subsidies, price supports, tariffs, licensing laws, exclusive government franchises, labor union privileges, immigration quotas, and the like. Such businessmen and wage earners form themselves into pressure groups and lobbies and seek to profit at the expense of the rest of the public. They and their spokesmen unscrupulously exploit the economic ignorance of the majority of people by appealing to popular misconceptions and using them in support of destructive policies. Their action is self-defeating in that the success of each such group in achieving the privileges it wants imposes losses on other groups that are greater than its gains. At the same time, its gains are canceled by the success of other groups 
in obtaining the special privileges they want. The net effect is losses for virtually everyone. For each group plund not only plunders others and in turn is plundered by them, but in the process the overall total of what is produced is more and more diminished. For example, what farmers gain in subsidies they lose back in tariffs, higher prices because of monopoly labor unions, higher taxes for welfare spending, and so on. Indeed, the gains of each type of farmer are even canceled in part by the gains of other types of farmers. For example, the gains of wheat farmers are lost back in part in paying higher prices for other fa subsidized farm products, like cotton, tobacco, milk, and so forth. In exactly the same way, the benefit of the higher wages secured by a labor union is lost back in the payment of higher prices for products produced by the members of all other unions, as well as in the payment of higher prices caused by subsidies, tariffs, and so on. <clears throat> the net effect works out to be that less of practically everything is produced because such policies both reduce the efficiency of production and prevent people from being employed. Virtually everyone is made worse off, those who become unemployed and those who continue to work. Because of the inefficiencies introduced, the latter must pay prices that are increased in greater degree than their incomes. And they must also use part of their incomes to support the unemployed. The pressure group members may subjectively believe that they are pursuing their self-interests. The supporters of altruism and socialism may believe that this absurd process of mutual plunder carried on by such groups represents capitalism and the profit motive. But the fact is that self-interest is not achieved by pressure group warfare, nor is the activity of pressure groups a characteristic of capitalism. On the contrary, it is the product of the mixed economy, an economy that remains capitalistic in its basic structure, but in which the government stands ready to intervene by bestowing favors and imposing penalties on various economic activities. Under capitalism in its logically consistent form, laissez-faire capitalism, the government has no favors to give and no arbitrary penalties to impose. It thus has nothing positive to offer pressure groups and creates no basis for their being formed out of considerations of self-defense. The absurdity of the pressure group mentality manifests itself in the further fact that it provides powerful support for the fear and hatred of self-interest emanating from altruism and thus leads to the suppression of the pursuit of self-interest. The practitioners of pressure group warfare are in the contradictory position of wanting to serve their own particular self-interests and yet with good reason simultaneously having to fear and oppose the pursuit of self-interest by others. Since under pressure group warfare, one man's gain actually is another's loss. The result is that while people strive to achieve their self-interest in their capacity as members of pressure groups, Yet in their capacity as citizens, they strive to create social conditions in which the pursuit of self-interest of any kind becomes more and more impossible. Because given their mentality, they cannot help but regard the pursuit of self-interest as antisocial, and thus must oppose it for everyone else, who in the meanwhile is opposing their pursuit of self-interest. In these ways, the irrational pursuit of self-interest by pressure group warfare actually represents people actively and powerfully working against their self-interest. The practitioners of pressure group warfare condemn economics because they do not understand it. Indeed, may have made themselves incapable of understanding it. <clears throat> their mental horizon is so narrow and confined that it does not extend beyond what promotes or impairs their immediate self-interest in their present investments and lines of work. They perceive the doctrines of economics entirely from that perspective. Thus, a shoe manufacturer of this type, who could not withstand foreign competition, hears economics doctrine of free trade from no other perspective than that if implemented, it would put him out of the shoe business. And thus, he concludes that he has a self-interest in opposing the doctrine of free trade. And for similar reasons, virtually every other doctrine of economics is opposed by the pressure groups concerned. To use the analogy to astronomy once more, it is as though people mistakenly concluded 
not only that the sun circled the earth and that morality itself supported the proposition, but also that their personal well-being required them to oppose any alternative explanation. This discussion points to the most fundamental and serious difficulty economics encounters, which is a growing antipathy to logic and reason as such. As Henry Hazlitt explains in Economics in One Lesson, an understanding of economics presupposes a willingness of the individual to open his mind to a view of the entire economic system extending over a long period of time and to follow chains of deductive reasoning explaining the effects of things on all individuals and groups within the system, both in the long run and in the short run. <clears throat> this broadness of outlook that economics presupposes is unfortunately not often to be found in today's society. Under the influence of irrationalist philosophy, people doubt their ability to achieve understanding of fundamental and broad significance. They are unwilling to pursue matters to first causes and to rely on logic to explain effects not immediately evident. In large part, people's reluctance to think reflects the influence of irrationalist writers who have come to the fore in field after field and who seem to take a positive delight in establishing the appearance of paradox and in seeming to overturn all that reason and logic had previously been thought to prove true beyond doubt. <clears throat> The most prominent figure of this type in economics is Keynes, who held, quote, that pyramid building, earthquakes, even wars, may serve to increase wealth if the education of our statesmen on the principles of the classical economics stands in the way of anything better, unquote. <clears throat> in other fields, renowned authorities proclaim that parallel lines meet, that electrons can cross from one orbit of an atom to another without traversing the interval in between that an empty canvas or smears made by monkeys is a work of art, and that the clatter of falling garbage pails or a moment of silence is a work of music. The ability of such views to gain prominence already reflects an advanced state of philosophical corruption. Once established, they give the realm of ideas the aura of a dishonest game, a game that serious people are unwilling to play or to concern themselves with. At the same time, they open the floodgates to the dishonest. In the realm of economics, the establishment of such views has enormously encouraged the pressure groups and advocates of socialism who have been able to, who have been enabled to propound their opposition to the teachings of economics under the sanction of an allegedly higher, more advanced, non-Euclidean economics. In addition, by depriving the intellect of credibility and substituting sophistry for science, their establishment has allowed demagogues to flourish as never before. The demagogues can count both on few serious opponents and on audiences not willing or able to understand such opponents. Thus, they have an open season in propounding all the absurd charges I described earlier that are, lab that are raised against capitalism. Economics by itself certainly cannot reverse this epistemological current. Even more than in the case of ethics, this must come from mainly within the field of philosophy. But economics or any other special science can certainly make an important contrib contribution to that reversal by means of refuting the irrationalists within its own domain. In refuting the theories of Keynes and similar authors, it can show that in economics there is no basis for the advocacy of irrational theories. And this perhaps may help to set a pattern for the same kind of demonstration in other fields. Economics, moreover, is uniquely qualified to demolish the apparent conflict between theory and practice which today's intellectuals experience in connection with the visible failure of socialism and the growing international acceptance of capitalism. <clears throat> The overwhelming majority of today's intellectuals, it must be kept in mind, believe virtually every single one of the points of the indictment of capitalism I described earlier. <clears throat> Thus, from their perspective, socialism should have succeeded and capitalism have failed. They had to expect that Soviet Russia, with its alleged rational economic planning and concentration on the building up of heavy industry, should long ago have achieved the kind of economic eminence that Japan has achieved under capitalism. At the same time, they had to expect that the United States and Western Europe should have fallen into greater and greater chaos and poverty. 
Yet despite everything they believe and think they understand, socialism has failed while capitalism has succeeded. Being unwilling to admit that they have been wrong in their beliefs, thoroughly, devastatingly wrong, they choose to interpret the failure of socialism and success of capitalism as proof of the impotence of the mind to grasp reality, and now turn en masse to supporting the ecology movement and its assault on science and technology. In this way, ironically, the failure of socialism and success of capitalism have played an, enorm and impl have played an important role in accelerating the growth of irrationalism. In presenting a correct theory of capitalism and socialism, that is, in explaining why in reason capitalism must result in a rising productivity of labor and improving standards of living, while socialism must culminate in economic chaos and a totalitarian dictatorship, economics reunites theory and practice in this vital area. It thereby reaffirms the power of the human mind and removes the failure of socialism and success of capitalism as any kind of pretext for irrationalism. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I have succeeded in explaining why economics is a subject that is well worth the serious study of every intelligent individual. Knowledge of it is absolutely essential for everyone who wishes to understand the world in which he lives and the factors which determine its change for better or worse. Knowledge of economics is essential for everyone who wishes to uphold individual rights and the existence of a rational society in which the individual is free to pursue his own self-interest. Thank you. Well, this took a little bit longer to deliver than I had uh, anticipated. Uh, I'll let Diane tell me when to stop. Uh, Mr. Valiant in the back. Okay, that's a good question. People point to the recent rise in the price of oil. <laughs> they cite it as an example of price gouging. They totally ignore the actual fact in the world, which is uh, uh, the takeover of a major oil producing area, a reduction in the supply of oil av available, a threat to still greater supplies of oil. So when the supply is less or the threat or the prospective supply is less, the price rises. Now people are objecting to the fact that someone makes a profit from this. They argue, well, you shouldn't make a profit, you shouldn't raise the price until your cost has gone up. <clears throat> now, uh, obviously, that's a nonsensical argument to start with. Someone has to raise the price before the cost is higher. But even so, you want, from an economic point of view, it's desirable that the oil industry get more profitable. <clears throat> if we want the supply of oil to be continued, if we want replacement facilities to become available, if we want firms to be able to replace their inventories as they're used up, it's desirable that the industry become more profitable. Anytime there's a threat to the supply and we need additional capacity, additional production, uh, a higher profitability of the industry is actually what is called for. So this is an example of economic ignorance. There's a gentleman right here uh, in the sweater. You had a, your hand up a moment ago? No? Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Coates. Um, yeah, your uh, point that you just made um, about since socialism was succeeding, excuse me, socialism was failed and capitalism was succeeding, you said that it, it made many intellectuals uh, conclude that the mind is, in, is impotent. Um, are you talking about their mind and exactly, I didn't, I didn't quite follow that. All right, I say that the failure of socialism, given all that today's intellectuals believe and still believe, they have to interpret as a failure of reason. Now, it is a failure of their minds, but uh, the, only, the only mind that anyone can be aware of is his own, and they interpret it as a failure 
of man's mind. Uh, and I think it's on this basis they're turning to environmentalism. Now, the appropriate response would be all of today's intellectuals, 99% of the professors and the media reporters and so on, they should all go on a long sabbatical and they should read the works of von Mises and Ayn Rand and in a two or three years come back and maybe they'll know something. <laughs> but <laughs> See, we have a problem where uh, the intellectual leadership of our society is thoroughly bankrupt, has made themselves into a absolutely, totally stupid people. <clears throat> and a, I think a good way to think of this is, see, they are increasingly saying, we have to abandon Western civilization. Science and technology cannot be relied upon. We've been wrong uh, for the last 200 years and even for the last 2,500 years. Our total civilization is wrong. That's their hypothesis. <clears throat> and people are saying, yeah, I guess we've got to consider this. I have a much more modest hypothesis, which is that the last several generations of intellectuals are thoroughly corrupt, should be totally ignored, and we need new intellectuals. Uh, Mr. Hull had a question. Yeah. Well, you say, what specific knowledge of economics should a layman possess? Now, if you're asking me, an intelligent person who's graduated college, I would say properly, in a proper educational program, by the time someone graduates college, he should probably have read all of the books of von Mises. And uh, Adam Smith and Ricardo and Menger and von Bavert. And, of course, in philosophy, all of the works of Ayn Rand. Uh, think of all of the books you've read, you, you had to read in your college careers, and what nonsense they added up to. If you wanted a serious uh, educational curriculum, uh, Ayn Rand and von Mises uh, should form the backbone of it, and then those other uh, authors I mentioned, and of course, uh, reading philosophers like John Locke and Aristotle, and some of our leading enemies too, like Plato and Aristotle, and uh, Kant, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, the young lady over here. Yeah. You don't. You say you don't understand the connection between the failure of socialism and the belief in the failure of the human mind. I didn't say the failure of the human mind caused the failure of socialism. Just think for a moment what the average intellectual today believes about capitalism and socialism. He believes capitalism is a system of exploitation, that it gouges the consumers, all of those things I named. And that's what he still believes. And at the same time, he believes that socialism is a system of uh, rational economic planning. Now, he observes the facts. The facts are an absolute contradiction of everything he believes yet he still believes these things. So he has to think there's an incredible split between theory and practice. What good is his mind? Suppose you had a mind that made you think that Russia should now have had the progress that Japan has had, and the United States should be in the state of collapse of Russia. And yet it's exactly the opposite. Well, that would literally blow your mind. <laughs> you see, uh, I think there are some uh, statements in Atlas Shrugged uh, describing what people think reason is. And if you have an insane idea of what reason is to start with, then you end up thinking things are crazy and irrational, which aren't. Well, socialism was thought to be uh, the logically demonstrable scientific system, scientific socialism. And they still believe it. Well, their minds, they've made their minds good for nothing. They need mental rehabilitation. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Boxer, yeah. yeah. Do you think it's in our, in our interest, economic or otherwise, for the U.S. to now invade the Iraq? Is it to our interest uh, to invade Iraq, uh, Iraq uh, economic or otherwise? Uh, conceivably, it could be, but fun uh, you see, I would say. It would be much simpler uh, to 
enact one law uh, prohibiting the bringing of, uh, of destructive, vexatious lawsuits against the development of energy supplies in the United States. It's not necessary for us to uh, get oil from Kuwait or Iraq or even the whole Middle East, but we need to have a free domestic economy to avoid that dependency. And if we did, then uh, we wouldn't have to be involved there. We could let them go their own destructive way. So I, I would say that's the policy we should pursue instead of war. The Sierra Club has a policy leading to war because they first make us dependent and um, now when supplies are threatened, we're put in this terrible position. This gentleman right here. To, to what extent are there any ecology issues that are real and how would the proper application of property rights address those? To what extent are there any ecology issues which are real and how would the proper application of property rights uh, address them. Now, I don't think there are any ecology issues which are real. There are certain problems that may exist. Uh, smog is very unpleasant, uh, makes life difficult for some people. Uh, you might have a polluted stream here or there or whatever. There are certain problems. Uh, I don't think there is any basis for the ecology movement uh, if uh, people were serious about uh, the environment and improving it, the first thing you have to be for is economic progress. Uh, economic progress promotes the environment. It's our, it improves our material conditions, our, the conditions of our material well-being. Uh, having a golf course where there used to be a desert, that represents an improved environment. Having a front lawn where there used to be scrubby hillside, that's an improvement in, in the environment. Having a roof over your head to keep out the rain and the hailstones, that's an improvement in the environment. Improving the environment is essentially coextensive with improvements in production. Now, as I say, you can have some localized uh, matters where it isn't so. Uh, I would have respect for, but not agree with, an effort uh, to eliminate smog by means of mandating atomic power, which uh, the environmental movement obviously does not support. See, uh, I think this is a, a phony issue. I think uh, the fundamental issue, deeper than ecology, uh, deeper than socialism, deeper than Mohammedanism, the Inquisition, I think there are lots of people walking around with tremendous amounts of pent-up hostility and hatred for other people. Sometimes they become serial murderers. Other times they're waiting for a mass movement to develop which they can latch on to and use as a vehicle for causing misery and death to other people. And you can read environmentalists where they openly say this. Uh, they call, uh, they hope for a virus to wipe out a million people. They relish a billion people, excuse me. Uh, Earth first thinks uh, the population of the world should be 10% of what it is today. Uh, they relish the image of an alligator uh, eating a terrified human being. Uh, I'll be glad to send you quotations on this. Yes? Uh, I work in the uh, energy industry. Yeah. Or do you say the uh, leaders in the energy industry whom you're aware of are demoralized and defeated? Yes, by and, the environmental movement, especially in California. And how could uh, you go about uh, reviving them? I don't know if there's any way uh, to go and revive those individuals, not any direct way. Uh, someone would have to go out and take on the environmental movement. And maybe they'd get revived if they saw perhaps uh, a trillion dollar lawsuit uh, against all of the leading environmental org organizations total up 
uh, how much higher has everyone's electric bill, heating oil bill, gasoline bill been for how many years as the result of their uh, restriction of the supply, and, and try to have a suit against them on that basis. Uh, <clears throat> when there were some cultural signs that the public recognizes the importance of an energy industry, that they don't think that energy comes about by magic and uh, somehow we'll get it and all we have to do uh, is uh, worry about uh, some emissions into the atmosphere, we'll destroy the industry, eliminate those emissions and somehow we'll still have the energy. Well, when people begin to realize that they, uh, have, they, they may have to accept a little bit a, a slight degree of uh, something some of them are exaggeratedly concerned about, well, then uh, it'll be worth making an effort. But you see, now there's no gain to uh, trying to put in atomic power. You're, no one uh, wants it, and you're vilified for the attempt. Yes? Yeah, I heard about that case, uh, an award to an animal trainer who the animal rights movement had singled out, uh, and they were vilifying him, and he got some kind of uh, judgment for damages. Well, let's hope it stands up on review. But that, that is an encouraging sign, but I don't know of any others. Hopefully there are some. Yes? Well, you say you say they're economists who uh, whose position is. Well, is that, a, is that a common view? You know that econ economics is a science that can function under, under any political. Well, there are many economists who have the position that economics as a science does not make value judgments, and um, it's just uh, deals with means to the achievement of ends which are determined by politicians. I think that's uh, totally false. I think uh, science itself depends on fundamental value judgments, such as the value of truth, honesty, integrity. <clears throat> you can't have science without those values. And of course, uh, an excellent article on fact and value is a recent one by uh, Leonard Peikoff of that title. Uh, I think uh, uh, there is no choice between freedom and slavery, or varying degrees of slavery. Uh, freedom is what we want. It has the status uh, in economics of an axiom, or should have, and it's the foundation of uh, all economic development. And any proper economics is uh, a pro-capitalist economics. Okay, well, thank you all very, very much. <laughs>